All right, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name's Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church, and as always, I'm thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be starting in verse 10 this morning. This is the final week of our Philippians series, but before we get into that, I do want to uh, let you know that next Sunday we're going to be having our first preview service for our Chester campus, and so that doesn't change anything here for tomorrow morning, but next Sunday, if, if you live in the Chester area or if you know anyone that does live in the Chester area, make sure to give them an invite card, make sure to invite them that next Sunday morning at 10 a.m., in Salem Church Middle School, we will be having our first preview service. So we're going to do one this month, we're going to do one next month, and then it's going to be every week, uh, September 9th and following, that we're going to have a campus in Chester. We're very excited about the doors that God has opened up there, the doors that He continues to open there, and the possibilities of furthering His mission in Chester, uh, specifically for those who are part of our church, who live in the Chester area, who are going to have a much easier way of making invite to people as we're going to have a location right by their house. And we're going to use wonderful technology to pull that off. It's called the automobile. So in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is bringing uh, this um, wonderful letter to a close that I have this tough thing that every book I preach through becomes my favorite book of the Bible. And so right now, the book of Philippians is my favorite book of the Bible, simply because I've, I've, I've known this, but as you kind of study at a deeper level, you become more aware of all of the intricacies of each book. And in this book, the apostle gives us such amazing doctrine, such amazing uh, theology of who God is, but then he's very quick for us to make the connections really in a way that you don't necessarily find as specific of an application throughout Scripture as to how we live out these deep fundamental truths of who Jesus is, and then more than that, who Jesus is for us through faith, and the impact that faith should be having in your lives. Last week, we delved into the topic of anxiety, as we saw in verse 6 of chapter 4 that said, do not be anxious about anything. Really a tough passage for many, a kind of stinging indictment on our culture and even on many of us in the way that we deal with anxiety in our lives, that God wants us to trust Him for our future rather than our fears about our future. Because that's really what anxiety is. It's an indictment on the value system of how you are dealing with your hopes of what the next five minutes, the next 15 minutes, the next day, the next year, the next five years of your life. And are you overwhelmed by what's going on just in the material world around you of, of possible failures, of possible fears of what may happen tomorrow? Or are you overwhelmed by the value system of the kingdom of God that Jesus has made promises about the future that are sure? And that when you trust Him with your future, when you trust the value system that He wants to build in your life through faith, you will not be anxious about anything, the apostle tells us. And God never gives us a command that He will not also empower us to obey. Did you know that? That God is not so mean, in a sense, He's not so arbitrary that he would throw a command out there to you that he will not also give you the strength for you to obey. And so for many of you, if you walk away condemned from a command like that, you walk away needlessly condemned because it is through faith that the Father, when he gives you a command, he also promises that if you will obey him, he will give you the strength to obey him. And so this week, as we turn to the end of Philippians, we're going to find some interesting thing where God tells us to trust Him more than we trust our circumstances. Because He wants to talk about the topic of contentment and what we base our contentment on. Contentment is a difficult thing because the Bible doesn't just say, be content. 
Because there are many things that you could base your contentment on that will not get you any closer to Jesus, that will not give you any more faith in Jesus, that will actually drive you far away from faith. Because many of you are building the keys for contentment in your life on circumstances that you are currently in or circumstances that you hope to enter into. And when you base your contentment on the circumstances that are having in your life, first, those circumstances are fleeting. And so your contentment may be short-lived before you need another circumstance to arise to bring you contentment. So it's faulty. But also, God has called you to base your contentment on the truth of who He is and on the life that He wants you to enter into. And so He wants you to build your contentment on only that which will give you more faith in Jesus. Only that which will grow you as a disciple of Jesus. Only that which will be eternal in value. And so in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, I want you to understand, is writing... From imprisonment. He's writing from a circumstance where his rights have been, in a sense, revoked. From a situation where he is under guard almost all the time. From a situation that, quite frankly, will end in his execution. Paul will not live past his present circumstances. Yet he's going to write to the church at Philippi and question their contentment because he's fully content in the situation that he's in. One that most of us would say is a situation that is impossible to be content in. And here's what the apostle writes starting in verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord. There it is again. Don't miss that. He continuously comes back to this key theme of rejoicing in the Lord. You cannot hope to have a life worth living without rejoicing in the Lord. He said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Number one, I want you to understand that contentment is a discipline, not a circumstance. Contentment is a discipline, not a circumstance. That's not how you're living. I want you to understand that. For you to be able to grasp what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he said, I have found in any situation that I'm in, in any circumstance of life, how to be content. That's a bold statement. But I want you to understand what you're dealing with with the Apostle Paul is not someone who can say that word and then you question whether or not he actually knows what he's talking about. You say, oh, he hasn't had it as hard as I have. He's had it pretty hard. 
The Apostle Paul has been persecuted at every level you could be persecuted at. He's lost everything that you could ever lose. And, you know, he writes a statement. He's there, oh, you know, I know how to be hungry. No, he's a guy that knew how to be hungry. Elsewhere in the Scripture, you find out that there were days and days where the Apostle would go without anything to eat. He'd been stoned and left for dead. Not the present day stoned, the archaic stoned, where they actually throw rocks at you. Some of you are like, I'd be content too. Not with this kind of stone. All right, this isn't Colorado. Calm down. They stoned him and they thought he was dead, so they left him. And he survived miraculously, got up, walked back in, kept preaching. He'd been beaten with lashes. Now he's imprisoned, shipwrecked at sea, bitten by snakes. I mean, the apostles got a life. And so he's a man that when he says, I found whatever situation I'm in, how to be content, he's not lying because he's been in all of the situations. He's endured all of the circumstances. But most of you, your contentment is based on if I could only... Your contentment is based on when I get this, when I finish this, when I receive this, when I get rid of this, when I gain this, when I lose this. That is what you are basing your contentment on, and that is why you are not content. Have you ever wondered why you're so miserable? Have you ever wondered why other people are happy about the same thing that you're miserable about? Have you ever wondered why another person can go through a situation and have a completely different reaction than you have because yours is overwhelmed by the negative and theirs is overwhelmed by the positive? Friend, I want you to understand that there is a key to contentment that you are missing out on when you base all of your contentment in whatever situation and circumstance that you are in. I mean, I want you to imagine what is the worst possible news that you could receive today. What's, what's the bottom line of this is the worst news I could receive. This is the worst thing that could happen. This is the thing that I have spent my life avoiding enduring. And if I were to have to endure it, I would lose everything and be miserable. <clears throat> it's going to be different for many of you. The same thing that could make you miserable may not make me miserable, and the same thing that would make me miserable might not make you miserable. The same thing that would cause me to despair isn't necessarily going to cause you to despair. Life is subjective in that. Our reactions are subjective in that. But whatever that thing is, what you need to understand is that the apostle is saying that there is a way to live, there is a faith to have, there is a life to build in which you could receive the worst news, you could face the worst circumstance, you could have the worst diagnosis, you could have the worst news about someone else's diagnosis, you could be completely rejected by the people that you want to accept you the most, and you could go through that and be completely content the entire time. It's going on. The entire path. And so we are not dealing with some mystical, out-of-body type of contentment that's up in the spiritual hoo-ha realm. We're talking about real-life situations where your lack of contentment in life is directly connected to how weak your faith is. Is show me someone that is discontent, and I will show you someone who does not have real faith in Jesus Christ. See, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it stops being about thou shalt not and starts being about what are you living for. Because many of you are basing your faith on what you've avoided. But the apostle is saying, What are you actually living for? What are you actually living out? See, he's coming at it from an ethic that Jesus is better than anything. 
See, circumstances should not dictate your contentment. Jesus should dictate your contentment. The power of rising above your circumstances is only available really through faith in Jesus. That's what Christians believe. So if you're a Christian, that's what you say you believe. So my question is, why do you not actually live out what you believe? Because this is not some extra bonus level of Christianity. This is just what Christianity is. It is a belief that the promises of Jesus are sure. The promises of Jesus are unshakable. The promises of Jesus are true, and they are truer than everything else. That's just what Christianity is. And the apostle is saying, if you believe that, you will be content. Again, my question, why are you not content then? It's because you're not really li- you don't really have a life worth living. A life worth living is one that is content in every situation. Because a life worth living believes the gospel is actually true. This is the continuing theme throughout Philippians. Look at what he says in verse 10. I said this is important a few minutes ago, but he returns to this theme of rejoicing in the Lord, and then he says something that seems to have absolutely nothing to do with rejoicing in the Lord. Do you ever get irritated when the Bible does that? It seems to have two messages in one sentence, and you can't decipher what the actual code is going on here. He's talking about rejoicing in the Lord, and he's like, I'm really glad you guys are my friends. So what does one have to do with the other? Because that's the key to Paul's contentment. The key to Paul's contentment is that he looked at every aspect of his life. He looked at every attribute of what he was doing, of how he was living, yes, of who he was partnering with. And then he connected the dots and he said, how does this cause me to rejoice in the Lord? That's why the scripture is so helpful. Because the apostle goes to how his partnership with the church in Corinth, excuse me, in Philippi, could cause him to rejoice in the Lord. He connects rejoicing in the Lord to absolutely everything in his life. But the question that you need to know to how to live your life is how does rejoicing in the Lord have anything to do with a church being concerned about his well being? The concern that they had for him was rooted in the community that they shared. Why? Because of a shared faith in the gospel. Because the partnership furthered the cause of the gospel. And because of that, Paul rejoiced because that is only available through the Lord. Many of you are getting up every morning making a hundred decisions and never asking one important question about your decisions. How Is this connected to rejoicing in the Lord? Sometimes you even do what on paper is a good thing. But you miss out on the blessing of it. You miss out on the contentment of the situation because you just do a good thing and that thing terminates on itself. You do not say, how does this cause me to rejoice in the Lord? You do not have a well thought out life. You do not say, in this decision that I am making about today, tomorrow, the next five years, about my future, how will this lead to me rejoicing in the Lord? You don't ask that question. And so you don't receive the contentment. The apostle is teaching us a very valuable lesson that we need to grow in how we think about our faith in Jesus. This is not just static facts that we throw up on a board so we know that we, on paper, believe the right things. These are things we must apply to our lives. And we must have the discipline to grow in these things. You must start somewhere if you hope to be content about anything. You need to have the discipline to grow. In Luke 9, Jesus says this, He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? See, Jesus is laying down a very important inventory question about your life. What good is any gain in this life if it does not cause you to rejoice in the Lord? 
See, because there is a way to go through life and not face any of it with faith. And when you do that, you may gain much where this world is concerned, but Jesus is saying you will lose everything where eternity is concerned. You will lose everything where your faith is concerned. And so your focus should not be on gaining the world system, but instead your focus should be, how can I gain faith? How can I grow faith? How can I build a life where everything that I do, everything that I look at, every decision that I make, every direction that I go, every direction that I take other people with me, it can all be traced back to, I do this because of my faith in Jesus. And some of you may say, oh, can you do that with everything? I sure hope you can. And so should you. But the reason that you're saying, oh, I don't think you can do that with everything, is because you're not doing it with anything. And when you're not doing it with anything, how can you ever have a vision for how you can do it with everything? That's why you must have a vision to grow in this. You see, Paul had gained Jesus. And because of gaining Jesus, he knew he could never lose himself. Are you ever afraid that you're going to lose yourself? Are you ever afraid that you're going to do something and you're going to forfeit your own soul somehow? That you're going to do something and you're going to lose everything that you have? You're going to do something and you're going to lose everything of value in your life? You're going to make a decision. And man, all the pressure's on you. If you're an adult, you should be making these types of decisions. Where if I, in this decision, it makes or breaks my family. With this decision, with this responsibility, I carry the weight of more lives than just mine. Have you ever faced something like that? And it's crippling, isn't it? Because you imagine facing things like that and say, regardless of how it turns out, I'll never lose myself. Regardless of how it turns out, I will never lose that which I really value. It doesn't make the situation any less important. It doesn't make stewardship of those situations any less vital. But what it does is it gives you a clear-mindedness that you know that the sun does not rise or set on you because if you have Christ, you can never truly lose anything of real value because you will never lose Christ. You will never lose his promises. You will never lose him. And that is completely freeing about the future because some of you are stuck in the past because you're afraid to risk anything to build the future that God wants you to build with your life because the weight is on your shoulder. But what the apostle had done is he had a faith in his life where he was not afraid to risk. He was not afraid to step into the future that God had designed because he knew that even if this decision doesn't work out, I cannot lose God. And if I don't lose God, I haven't lost my future. He knew how to be content in any situation. What are you holding on to that God wants to free you from the burden? He wants to free you from the worry. He wants to free you from the stress. But you must have faith to move forward to experience it. Some of you are sitting still. You're not content. You're completely discontented. And you're completely overwhelmed by the situations of your life. And God is saying, for you to experience real freedom, you must trust Him enough to move forward. You have to grow in that. You, you can't just do that. Did you know that? Because sometimes I think, you know, and this is kind of the fault of preachers sometimes, is that we get excited. And we start talking about the future, and you're just like, man, let's charge hell with an M16, all right? Let's do something crazy. I'm going to quit my job tonight. And I never said that, all right? And so you walk out, and you do something, and you're like, well, I'm still not content. That's because it takes a lot of building to get where Paul was. It takes this thing that, that I've seen in our culture and in our day and age that is so difficult because it, we, we require less and less of it to live comfortable lives in this age. It's called discipline. It's called habit, rhythm of life. 
And the apostle is trying to get us to build a discipline so that we can do this on a consistent basis. You see, for many of you, you will not give yourself time to grow. You want to do one thing at one point and everything works out after you do one thing. And when it doesn't work out the way you want it to, when you did that one thing, you gave up. I mean, many of you one time went to a cycling class at a gym and you didn't know how hard it was to stand up and pedal at the same time. I went through that. And I'm going to talk about Pastor James for a minute. It was a few, <laughs> few years ago. It's probably embarrassing. I don't even know why I'm telling this story because it's embarrassing about me. We went to a spin class. It was like 6 a.m. And I'm wide awake by 6. He's not. And, and so we, we went in and we're like, I've ridden a bike before. What's a big deal? Within five minutes, I was in tears. And then she said, now stand up on your bike and pedal. And I said, you can't do that. It's not going, my muscles are not listening anymore. So by the end of the class, I thought I was going to die. And so we walked out. But the key is, is sometimes you will do something like that in your life and you will say, man, that was really difficult. I'm never going back. I'm never trying that again because it was hard. And when because of a one-time thing that was hard, you never go back, you miss out on the blessing of setting a rhythm in your life, of growing in a discipline in your life, of getting fit in a way in your life that if you were to continue to go back over and over and over, exhibit faith after faith after faith, it isn't that the situation is going to get easier, it's that you will build the stamina in your faith to continue to grow. And then you can look back and you say, that which I thought was impossible is now the most expedient thing I can do with my life. Because now I have a life worth living. Because now I'm experiencing the presence of God in ways that I never thought. It doesn't give you an easy life. It will give you a harder life. But what it will do is, is it will prepare you to face difficulty with faith that if you had not built it over time, you would not have had it when you needed it. The problem is that you don't understand that faith is only valuable when you need to use it. And God wants you to keep entering into environments where you need faith. But because one time this one thing happened with this one scenario, you're afraid to go back. God wants you to conquer your fear with real faith. You see, Paul turns situations of despair into times of worship. Paul turns situations of despair into times of worship. See, Paul's ethic is seen in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, he was immovable because of the focus that he had with faith. Number two, contentment is rooted in faithful mission. Contentment is rooted in faithful mission. You see, godly contentment requires a life of faith. It does. But it might be said, and I know there's some of you in here, I'm content and I'm not following Jesus. So what do I need a different type of contentment for if I already have it? You see, that may be true, but I want you to understand that the ends of that contentment is death. The ends of contentment without Christ is condemnation. The contentment that Paul is talking about here leads to life. And the Bible is filled with stories of people that sought contentment apart from God. And many thought they had found it. But the ends of their lives, though, is nothing but death and condemnation and loss. Because that's not real contentment. That's not the type of contentment that God designed you to have. He is rooting his contentment in that which leads to life and eternity with the joy of God. That is why he is rooting unpleasant circumstances in contentment. Because contentment outside of God is dictated by the pleasure of any given circumstances. It's not dictated by that rather. 
See, you're just going from situation to situation looking for contentment. What if you could have the same thing across all circumstances? Because some of you are desperate about the circumstances of your life rather than being desperate for the presence of the work of God. You are desperate because, God, I need you to get me out of this circumstance. Or you are desperate because you're saying, God, I need you to get me into this type of circumstance. And that is what rules your life. That is the vision that's overwhelming you. But the Father says, don't be desperate for that. Be desperate for me. When was the last time you were desperate to experience the presence of God? When was the last time you were desperate to experience a move of God? And I'm not saying a move of God that alleviates a circumstance. I'm just saying a move of God that grows you closer in relationship to him. See, that reveals the level of life that you're actually living. What are you more desperate about, your circumstances or your God? Or are your circumstances actually your God? See, you need the contentment that's only found in the life that Paul was living, and that is a life of pursuing faithful gospel mission. You see, to build this life, you must determine to follow Jesus. And you must be unbending in that determination. I mean, look at what he says in Philippians 4.13. This is an interesting text because almost everybody knows this text. And almost everybody massacres what this text actually means. You see, baseball players, Philippians 4.13 is in my bill, always reminding me of Jesus. I'm going to hit home runs for the Lord. I can hit home runs for Jesus. Now, I do believe Jesus Christ could hit a curveball. All right, don't get me wrong. But that has nothing to do with the apostles talking about here. I'm going to get that raise. I can do all things through Christ's strength. It's not what he's talking about here. Notice that everything that you want to envision God doing in your life makes your circumstances more comfortable for you so you won't have to experience any bad things so that you can be the champion, so that you can be the focus, so that you can be the hero, so that you can have what you want all the time. See, in Philippians 4.13, what the apostle is actually talking about is he's saying, I can endure the hardest of situations because I've got a Savior who endured the hardest of situations and rose from the dead. I can do this. I can endure imprisonment. What's my imprisonment based on? My imprisonment is based on that I wanted to live a life where I furthered the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, where I told more and more and more people. And I told so many people that I was changing cultures. I've been run out of towns because I changed their cultures. I was in Jerusalem and I was seeking to change the culture for Christ. And now I'm in prison in Rome, far away from home. But I'm changing a culture for Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He's saying, I can live for Jesus because Jesus is going to strengthen me to live for Jesus. See, your definition of all things is really important. Because most of the time, your all things aren't the same all things that are Jesus' all things. Because this definition of all things, if it's not about Jesus, it's not what he's going to strengthen you to do. Most of your all things are just your base selfish desires. See, what happens when you are seeking to grow as a disciple and seeking obedience and circumstances arise that discourage you while you're seeking that? Because that's going to happen. This is what this text is all about. If it inspires you to do a great thing with what you're doing, fantastic. But understand that in that, there needs to be a rootedness in rejoicing in the Lord to the things that you are pursuing. Do they connect? Do they go back? Do they root you into the promises that God has actually made? See, because choosing one thing is always choosing against something else. Always. 
And some of you, you are building a life where every choice that you make takes you further and further from the contentment that God wants to give you. But then you have the audacity to blame God for your bad decisions. You're not content, but it's because you're making bad decisions. And then you have the audacity to try to hold God responsible for the bad decisions that you made over a course of 20 years. That's audacious. Own your life. Own it. It's like when your dog takes a dump on the carpet. I mean, it really is. Dog lovers out there, that's, that's the moment where you question your dog loving. And what do you do? You, you don't go to the dog and be like, can you explain to me uh, whose fault this was? Could you help me understand who? And I know you did it, but maybe it wasn't your fault. Maybe it was my fault. Am I to blame? No, that's not how you go to the dog. You put your executioner's mask on. <laughs> you grab the sickle. All right. And you're like, the reaper's coming, Rover. And you're like, you know, just doing all sorts of abusive things. And it's like, man, I didn't know you were capable of such abuse. So, so often in our lives, we do wrong things. And our refusal to own the poor decisions, our refusal to own the unwise, is going to prevent us from growing in Jesus Christ. If you would just own your life, That is a potential moment where you could repent to something better. Where you could repent to real growth. But so long as you're the victim, you will never see one bit of spiritual growth in your life. You need to be content to pursue faith. You need to be content to own your life and follow Jesus and make decisions that are really spirit-filled decisions. See, the fear should be contentment without mission. The fear shouldn't be living the mission of Jesus and losing the contentment that I have and the value system of this world. If you are content and the work of Jesus is not active in your life, then what is your faith all about? See, the apostle casts this amazing vision for life in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. He says, thanks be to God who in Christ Jesus always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. I mean, all of your accomplishments should point to Jesus. All of your partnerships should point to Christ. All of your commitments should point to Christ. All of your disappointments should point to Christ. All of your pain should point to Christ. God has called you, note this, into a triumphal procession through this life. that seeks to show where he is in each and every moment, each and every decision, each and every circumstance, each and every commitment, each and every discipline. But what does he promise? It will be triumph. No matter what you're going through, it will end in triumph. How do you do that? Well, it's always about trusting the work of Jesus. See, he furthers the thought from 2.14 in 2 Corinthians 9.8. He says, God is able. Did you know that? One of the most important attributes of God that you can form a faith in is the ability of God. And the, the Bible says it over and over again, many different ways. God is able. He's able in this situation to make all grace abound to you, not just some grace, all grace, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. That seems to be a bit of an inclusive sentence. You may abound in what? Every good work. God wants you to do something with your life. He wants you to do something with your faith. So if you are brought low, praise be to God. If you have abundance, praise be to God. See, that's why it's, the gospel is amazing for all cultures. The gospel is amazing for all economic classes. The gospel is amazing in any situation. 
Because if you are struggling to make ends meet, praise be to God, he is going to use this struggle to make me more like Christ. Or if you have never known a day of hunger, you have never known a day of want, you have never known a day of struggle. You can say, thanks be to God. All glory to him. And you're like, oh, that may be easy. No, it's not. Because the Father has a different path. The Father then wants to teach you a valuable lesson of how not to depend on your wealth to define you, but rather how to steward your wealth for his glory. There is no such thing as ease in following Jesus. In no class, in no system is it easy. But understand that contentment, number three, it requires trust in the Lord. It requires trust in the Lord. You cannot get away from that. You cannot get away from that key element that the apostle in imprisonment. I I love the way that this text ends. He looks to them and he says, I am so thankful that you guys have partnered with me over the course of so many years. Did you know that you were the first church to partner with me? I was sending support letters to some churches and they were laughing at me. They're saying, I'm not going to give you a dime. But you, you supported me. You, you helped me. You, you sponsored this move of God through this people. And he says, it was kind of you, but not that I need it. I'm thankful for it, but it doesn't define me. I'm thankful for the gain. I'm thankful for the comfort. I'm thankful that it's a little bit easier. I'm thankful that I'm able to afford a little bit better transportation. I'm thankful that I'm able to do this because of your partnership. But that is not what defines who I am. Because in verse 17, I do not seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. See, there Paul is talking about gain. We think about everything with the gospel about loss. But the apostle here, he's saying that I'm not seeking the gain of material wealth, but when I get it, do you know what I use it for? Gospel fruit. I invest it in the gospel. He says, I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours. Wait a second. Paul is imprisoned, and he looks around at a situation. He's like, I can't go where I want. I can't do whatever I want. I don't even have authority to dictate my freedom. I don't have the authority to dictate tomorrow. Somebody else is going to tell me what my tomorrow is going to look like. Somebody else is going to tell me where I can go and what I can do. And ultimately, we know that the end of this is Paul ended up getting executed. But he looks at a church filled with free people. And he says, guys, I, and you know, in a southern way of saying it, I'm living high on the hog. I've got everything I need. I've got everything I could ever want. And don't worry, God will be as good to you as he's been to me. (laughs) He's imprisoned, they are free, and he's trying to help them be content. He says, verse 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. And where are those riches found? Christ Jesus. The apostle looks to this church and he says, you could learn from me. (laughs) See, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, the wise one wrote, he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you say, I want that. And you can only have it when you refuse to lean into your own understanding. So many of you, the struggle that you have is is that you trust in the Lord and then you lean into your own understanding. Here's what you need to understand, then you don't trust in the Lord. The moment that you lean into your own understanding is, is that you are not going to grow in your trust in God. Often what we need to propel us into the next chapter of our lives for God's glory is different than what we want. 
And that's why he will supply your needs according to his riches. He will define the need that needs to be supplied, and you must trust God enough to trust that. But when you lean into your own understanding, contentment goes out the window because you don't trust God with what you need. You just trust God with what you think you need. Often our prayers are more like, God, if you will give me what I want, I will follow you with faith. No, you won't. You will just want another toy. You will just want another moment of relief. Faith is not driven by what we want. Faith is driven by the trust that God knows what we need and we move and we go and we invest with the faith that if the moment is based on who Jesus is, then I will take the outcome even if it's not what I expect because I trust that God will use whatever outcome to grow me in His glory, even if it's painful even if it's hard. Why? Because I'm not leaning into my own understanding. I'm striving to build a life where I trust God's understanding. You have to break through to that if you want a life worth living. Friend, do you trust the Lord? Does your life reflect it? Do your reactions proclaim it? Paul had everything he needed and he was in prison. Paul wasn't praying, God, if you'll get me out of this one, I'll love you a little bit more. God, if you'll get me out of this one, I will volunteer one more time a month. Paul looked around and he said, I've got everything I need. Use me, Lord, for whatever you want. According to his riches in Christ Jesus. Such an important line. Because it goes back to the issue of values. What do you define as riches? And what did Paul define as riches here? See, Paul was imprisoned, awaiting execution, but he's content because he's got everything he needs because God would be glorified. He was certain of that. Are you certain that God is being glorified through the decisions that you're making right now and the life that you're living right now? The attitude that you have right now. Is God getting glory out of that? See, because Paul was sure that God was getting glory out of what he was doing. Can you say that with certainty? If you can't say that with certainty, that's why you're not content. Every single one of you is looking and investing in hopes that you will have a life worth living. That's what you all hope for. But the message that you need to understand from Philippians is that the only life worth living is one that is found in Jesus Christ. It is only found in trusting God with everything. Rise above your circumstances. Rise above them. Some of you are perpetually disappointed. If you are really honest, you're just disappointed with your life. You're disappointed in what you got. You're disappointed in what you're getting. You're disappointed with the path. You're disappointed with where tomorrow's looking. You are disappointed in everything that you've built so far. Friend, rise above that disappointment. Trust in the Lord and you will begin to build a life worth living. And you will have contentment in the middle of God's mission field. Jesus is worth more than anything that this world can give you. He is. But it is only when you truly believe that that you will have everything you need. As we go to our time of response where we proclaim the Lord's death through communion, contentment's tough because sometimes when you think you're content, you wake up the next morning only to feel completely different than you did the night before. And what seemed good doesn't seem good anymore. What seemed satisfying now is quite bland. And that's why it requires faith. 
That's why it requires that you build trust over a long season in your life where you invest and you steward over a long season to say, I trust the Lord and and I'm going to not lean into my own understanding, but because I believe the gospel, I believe he is wiser, I believe he is holier, I believe he is better. And I'm going to invest. I'm going to invest in what matters. I'm going to invest in what endures. And the only things that matter and the only things that endure are the things that are done to further the mission of Jesus in this world to make him known. That is what Paul had tapped into with his life. Jesus, his body was broken. His blood was shed so that he could redeem you from your sin. He paid the penalty the ultimate price, and then he calls you, he says, come, believe in me, and then go and live a life of resurrection because he had the power over death. And so this morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, instead of reflecting in communion, I'm going to ask you to put your faith in Jesus. I'm going to ask you to turn from your sin. I'm going to ask you to trust that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that he's your Lord and Savior. If that's you, slip out into the foyer where someone can pray with you and talk to you. But for those of you that are in here and you're followers of Jesus, when was the last time you felt real contentment? When was the last time you trusted that Jesus truly was enough? When was the last time your contentment was not driven by how you felt when you woke up that morning? That's the life that God wants you to have, one in which your contentment is rock solid. He wouldn't call you to it if he didn't want to empower you to have it. If you're a follower of Jesus, the tables around this room are open. Come, eat and drink, and then go build a life of contentment in the Lord. When you are ready, come.